Well, good morning. We are here at the Prairie Center Church of God of Prophecy in Olathe, Kansas, and we're doing our wonderful lesson series. Now, this is actually pretty needful, uh, but it's uh, I have yet to have any other volunteers to teach the class. So we're doing a series on the scriptures that are difficult to understand, and uh, today is no exception, but we do want to uh, try to understand it as best we can, um, and, and hopefully we'll uh, hear from God today. Uh, our golden text comes from Ephesians 6 and 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, wickedness in high places. And that's one of the things that we want to make sure today's lesson uh, that we keep in mind is that the wars that we are fighting, um, and that's the title of today's uh, Wars of Extermination, the wars that we are fighting are spiritual wars. Um, now, there are obviously physical wars that are happening around us, and we may be attacked in a physical sense, but all of them are rooted in spiritual battles. And, and so often, as uh, we've explained, uh, the, the Old Testament is what we're going to use as our primary example today. And as we've explained over the years, many times, and hopefully we can understand it uh, more and more each day, that the, the physical things that were happening in the Old Testament are going to be related to us in, in a more spiritual sense today. You know, we don't want to ever say that the things that, that were uh, happening here didn't happen, because I believe that the Word of God was inspired by the Holy Spirit for men to record what God uh, uh, spoke to them and what actions were taken. And so if we believe that the Word of God is what it says it is, then these things really did happen. Um, and the, the, the context, I, I, I hearken back to our covenant that we do uh, when we join this local body. Uh, we, we, we pledge to take the whole Bible, and how do we take it? Rightly divide it. We, we, we use the parts, we, we, we compare and contrast the various parts of the Bible together and, and try to understand what it means for us today. And by doing that, we take the New Testament as our rule of practice and faith and discipline, you know, that we, we uh, abide by those things. And why do we say it that way? Because if you were to take literally some of the things that the Old Testament was talking about, um, you know, we would be um, in, in some physical battles with people right now that, that God would be unhappy with us for. So uh, th that's some of the things that makes it a little bit hard to understand the uh, descriptions that are given in these Old Testament accounts about these, these wars that were happening. But what we have to understand is that those were often uh, directed at specific peoples, um, at a specific time for a specific reason. And what we understand in all of that is that God is holy and God is just. We don't understand God's ways. We may not even fully understand these scriptures even after the lesson today. There are still things that we struggle with in, in how we should apply them. Um, and, and, you know, the, the concept of going to war is something that, that many people have struggled with. Um, people have various opinions about whether a war is just or unjust. And uh, if a war is just, that means that, uh, that we would be justified in participating in that. If a war is unjust, what, what do we do? And so those are lots of moral questions that come up uh, that will continue to plague humanity until the end of time that we'll uh, uh, get to here in just a moment. Um, but as we look at these um, examples of, of battles uh, and, and, and times in the Old Testament, well, we want to think about how did God come to the decision to do this. And so um, uh, I, I want you to think about a few examples that uh, were outside of mankind's um, control. Okay, You think about something like the flood. You know, what was the reason for the flood? The, the, the people were evil continually. They had abandoned God. They had abandoned God's direction and the promises that they had made to him to, to serve him. And so God destroyed all those people, uh, and, and except Noah and his family, as, as we know the story goes. But we think about that, you know, the pictures that you see, you always see this, you know, there's, there's men and women clamoring around the ark trying to get in. Uh, you don't think about the, 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 the children, the elderly, the, the, the infants, 
that also perished at that time. And that's that's hard for us to to justify in our mind. It's hard to wrap our minds around. You think about uh, the story or the events in Sodom and Gomorrah when the the uh, again, there was judgment that came from God because of their uh, idolatry, because of their um, uh, behavior, and be, because of their sinfulness. Okay, the, 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 We know that Lot and his daughters escaped, but we also know that the entire cities were wiped out. That would have included the women, the children, the elderly, all of those. And again, it's hard for us to, 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 to understand but we, when we look at the character of God and we look at how this applies to us today and we look at the end times, okay? When the end times come and judgment comes on this earth, um, there's going to be judgment for everyone that is here. Now, we, we understand that, that, that infants and children, you know, even though they may be a, a part of the destruction, that God is merciful in, in those situations. But those that are of a, an accountable age are going to be accountable to God in, in the time of judgment. And so thinking about the way God uh, acted towards people that were disobedient and were sinful and were idolaters and, and worshiped false gods and did false worship, the way he uh, judged them in the Old Testament is going to be consistent with the way he judges in the New Testament. In our modern day sensitivities, we want to say, well, God is love and, you know, it's all, you know, it's all, uh, everything's beautiful and everything's peaceful and God is love. And, and those are all true, but God is also a God of judgment. And, and there will be a time when he comes to an end and that judgment will come. And so think of that in the context of, of what we're doing and how do we then prepare ourselves for that coming judgment um, as we apply this. Okay, now that was a, a, a lengthy preamble to today's lesson. We've got lots of, of uh, scriptures to go through and the, this will relate to a lot of, of events that were in the Bible that, that there's a lot of backstories to that we just don't have time to get in to the entire backstory today. Um, if you have an interest in the Old Testament, those things are interesting to, to plug in all the parts and pieces and figure out sometimes centuries before there were things that happened that, that the judgment comes later. Uh, you know, So sometimes the judgments of God are immediate. Um, the, the one that comes to mind in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied to God, they were, they were struck down immediately. Sometimes it was uh, decades later that people received the judgment of God. The children of Israel, as they marched in the wilderness and wandered in the wilderness, you know, some of them, that 40 years, the judgment of their disobedience may have taken 40 years for it before they finally uh, died and, and were not allowed to go into the promised land. So all of those things are, are kind of running through our mind as we look at today's lesson. But let's go to Deuteronomy. 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 Chapter 7, when these wars are uh, commanded by God uh, for, for the destruction for a reason. Okay, um, And so in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1, it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the uh, Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. He says you, the, the, this all goes back to the promise that God had made to Abraham, that he was going to inherit this land, that his uh, offspring and his, uh, uh, the fruit of his loins would be a great nation and they would inherit this land. This promise went back centuries. It is being fulfilled now. But there were other people that had inhabited that land. And it lists seven there. And all of these nations individually were greater than the Israelites. They were established. They had walled cities. They had uh, standing armies. They, they were well prepared to defend their nations. Uh, but God says, I'm going to, I have promised this to you, and I'm going to fulfill that promise. Now, the thing it, it doesn't talk about in this uh, section specifically, but it says, uh, uh, you know, God is going to, to deliver them unto you, but it, it doesn't talk about their idolatrous nature, that these, all of these nations that were inhabiting this area um, had abandoned God. They were worshiping idols. 
They were performing um, just uh, mind-blowing uh, things with, with child sacrifice. There was uh, pr prostitution was rampant. And it, part of their uh, worship was, was uh, involved sexual immorality, and, and just there was, there was debauchery around it. It was just all uh, uh, anti-God. It was all in, in conflict with God's laws and with God's uh, uh, judgments. And so the, one of the reasons that God was allowing these countries or these nations to be purged out of that area is because of their disobedience to God. It wasn't just because Israel wanted that land, but it was that God had promised it to them, and God, uh, if the, the other people had been obedient to God, they, they would have been allowed to stay, I think. But they were disobedient, they were idolatrous, and God uh, said that he was going to, 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 to push them out. And it says in verse 2, it says, Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shall thou make marriages with them. The daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. I mean, that sounds uh, harsh, and that sounds, uh, it says, don't have any mercy, just destroy them all. Okay? So so Why? You know that that's that's the question that runs through our mind. Why that that just seems that seems wrong, okay? But what we have to understand is God understood uh, more than we understand. We we know that from lots of scriptures that God's thoughts are above our thoughts, and we we don't understand why. But we can have some uh, inclination here is that those people um, were uh, wicked, and those people were going to drag the, the children of Israel away from God. And we saw multiple examples of that through their history where that did happen. So how do we apply that to us? Does that mean that we abandon everybody that's not perfect in our lives? Does that mean that we don't associate with anybody that is not a, a, a true believer in God? No, but there, there are going to be times when we come to know God and we come into a relationship with God that we're going to have to purge certain things out of our lives. That doesn't mean that we have to abandon uh, people that uh, that we care about, but it may mean that you have to change a friendship, that you may have to change a behavior, that you may have to change something about your life. Um, and and that, that concept, well, I can keep just a little bit of this. I can keep just a little bit of that in my life. This is an easy lesson to teach uh, that kind of concept to, to young people because you know the young people are terrible. You know they're just they're they, they, they're they're the, their world is full of temptation and they're making decisions that, that will affect the rest of their lives. Okay, and making decisions that will affect their eternal life. But did you know that no matter what age you are, you're still fighting those same battles. You're still fighting a temptation. It may be a different temptation that you had as a 15-year-old, but as a 50-year-old, I still felt temptation. I still uh, felt um, uh, the tug of, of sin uh, tempting me away. Okay, And there were, are still things that I have to put away from my life and, and completely remove for um, to, to be able to follow God more fully. Okay? And so think about that in these contexts when God told them, get rid of everything that is not about me, because I am righteous and I am holy and they are not. Okay? Um, and again, we, we, I don't ever want to have somebody say, well, you know, that gives me permission to, to go around and, and, and kill everybody that is disobedient to God. Okay, we've seen extremists that will do that. They will they will uh, falsely apply God's uh, uh, word here, as it was stated in the Old Testament, to a New Testament thing, and they'll 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 commit atrocious acts in God's name, which is, is not uh, proper. And so we don't ever want to do that. We still want to follow New Testament principles that that God loves everyone. God wants everyone to be saved. But in our own lives, there are times when we have to make changes uh, to, to purge things that are going to affect us later on in our life. Okay, um, uh, let's go down to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16. It says, But the, of the cities of these people, which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, 
but thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, and it goes through the whole list of these, because uh, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Um, and, and the reason is, in verse 18 it goes on, it says, that they teach you not to do after their abominations, which they have done unto their gods. So should you sin against the Lord your God. He, he you know, it, it's explained in some uh, uh, detail there that the reason you're to destroy them is so they don't lead you away from your God and lead you towards their God. Now, we know that the Israelites uh, uh, did this perfectly according to God's word, didn't they? Well, obviously they did not. They they did uh, they they allowed their their own greed, their own sympathies, their own desires to uh, contradict what God had instructed them to do. They said, "Well, you know what? This over here is valuable to me personally, so I'm going to keep that instead of destroying it." Like God said, I'm sympathetic to this situation, so I'm going to maintain that even though God told me to destroy it. And we know that that uh, uh, eventually those things came back to um, uh, to destroy them and to, to cause them to do harm. Um, so one of the reasons God allowed those wars was for uh, their uh, preservation as far as uh, it was a commandment of God based on righteousness and holiness. Sometimes these wars of extermination were done strictly for their uh, self-preservation of ourselves or others. You know, the, if you are attacked, um, it, whether it's individually or uh, nationally, uh, you know, it, it seems righteous to be able to defend yourself. And sometimes that defense comes at, at a very heavy cost. It may require you to take a life in order to save a life. And so those are circumstances uh, where we, we see that um, uh, it is possible to, to do those types of battles in a justified way. Um, and, and is every situation like that? Boy, that's uh, always and never are, are hard things to say, you know, because there are times even Christ himself, he was able to defend himself, but he chose not to. Okay, um, and, and there were other uh, martyrs that uh, that died at others' hands that that appeared to put up very little defense on on their own case because they were they were doing it according to God's will. So there there are lots of of uh, uh, things in there that that uh, it's hard to say there are absolutes, but there are definitely times when God's people, especially, were um, allowed and even encouraged by God to defend themselves. To, to secure their own uh, self-preservation, or m more specifically, it was done, it, it, they were commanded to defend others that were being persecuted. If the, if the poor were being persecuted, if widows and orphans were being mistreated, God was very adamant, you must go defend them. You must take up arms and, and do what you need to do to defend the righteousness of God and to protect those that are unable to protect themselves. So there are definitely times when God uh, uh, encourages that and, and commands us to do those things. But when it comes to a point of complete and utter destruction, that, that then becomes a little hard for us to understand uh, based on what it was uh, taught about in the Old Testament. So there are times when it's done as a, as a command from God, and we don't necessarily understand why they did that. It, there were other times when it was done as a means of preservation for themselves or others. And it was other times, uh, and, and some of these kind of blend together, that it was a judgment uh, from God. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 It says, um, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost part of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Okay, uh, so that's where we have to, uh, or let's go to 19 also. It says, therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord hath given thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt uh, shall not 
forget it. Okay, so uh, a little backstory there. When the children of Israel were wandering through the, uh, the wilderness, Amalek and his army would hide in wait and, and all the stragglers, all the, you know, like the lions uh, seeking out the weak antelope and the, the weak gazelles, the, the Amalek would come up behind the Israelites and, and he would pick off the weak and the feeble that were following behind. And, and he was uh, attempting to destroy God's people just by taking a little bit of them a time that were the weakest and the most feeble. And this was years later that, that God is reminding him, uh, remember what that tribe did. And, and as judgment for what they did, we're going to, to wipe them out, that they, they are going to be completely eliminated. Now, that didn't happen in this. They, they did not follow through with this at this time, and it had to come up again later. Saul, many years later, actually had to complete that commandment from God. And, and throughout that time period, the Amalekites continued to plague the Israelites. And so the, 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 the idea there is that when you don't completely remove the sinfulness and, and those the judgments of God, when you don't abide in the, the, the righteousness and judgment of God completely, then it's going to continue to be a challenge for you spiritually. And so uh, uh, we as Christians, we need to, to apply some of that, uh, um, uh, pur that purge to our lives and, and get rid of things that are uh, a temptation to us. Get rid of things that are going to, to drag us down. First um, Samuel chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, it says, Samuel also said unto Saul, this is that, that event with the Amalekites again, it says, the Lord sent me to anoint thee over the king of the pe to be king over the people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for them in the way, and when he when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both men or man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. And so he they everything that was associated with them, uh, we know that that uh, they were commanded to destroy. Um, and we we know even there that they didn't follow completely. That somebody uh, kept some of the, the the bounty and and caused uh, uh, more strife in Israelite until they finally could overcome it. So every time God said, get rid of something completely in their lives, if they weren't completely obedient, it came back to haunt them. It came back to create a spiritual challenge for them or a physical challenge or judgment from God came upon them when they didn't do um, uh, what God had, had told them to do. Well, yes, sir. I think that, um, you know, you might look and say, why are Right. And my thought is that if they would have taken those, every time they looked upon them, they would remember where it came from. And God saying, I don't even want you to remember what happened here that destroyed everything. So when you look on, you know, so there is no remembrance. Right. Right. Yeah. The reason they, he was saying that they wanted to destroy those is that we don't want to remember that, that those were came from those sinful people. We don't want to, to have any association with that. And we also don't want to ever say that, that uh, God cannot supply everything that we need. You could say, well, I need this because it will make my life better. Uh, but God is everything that we need. And, and if you need something, God has promised that he will supply it to us. So that, that's a great point. Um, and so uh, another uh, situation here, um, the, the Midianites, this was another circumstance where the, the, uh, there was a tribe of people that were being contrary uh, to God and they were trying to entice them away. And what the Midianites did is they took their, their, their women Okay, and they enticed the men of Israel to come and and participate in their idol worship. And and when when you say that, it, it seems well. How how did they do that? Well, it, it, you know, not to be too graphic, but but many of these cultures, there was temple prostitution that was associated with that. So there was the, they the, they were lured away from the, their service to God by the the temptation of physical pleasure. 
Okay, and and that's something that continues to plague us today. And so, that, you know, when we are in a situation where we are enticed by something, we need to uh, distance ourselves from that and create a, a, a righteousness level that that would be pleasing to God. And so, this is what happened here um, in Numbers chapter thirty-one. Uh, the, the whole story is in verses one through twenty. Um, but we'll just read a, a couple of selected verses. In verse 1 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. Um, and it, what he did is he gathered an army together, and he, he told them to go out against the Amorites, or, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the Midianites. He says in verse 10, it says, And burn all their cities wherein they dwell, and all their goodly castles with fire. And, uh, and they took all the spoil, and they, they divided it up amongst them. But in um, uh, verse 20, it's, um, uh, I'm sorry, verse 17, it says, Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. And so it was, again, a, a complete and, and utter devastation of that population. Um, and it was done because of what they had done. They, they, the women had lured the men away and had done it intentionally to draw them away from God and to entice them away. And so that was the, the judgment of God uh, was being exacted. Just like uh, we talked about the flood, God uh, is a God of judgment and of righteousness. Sometimes God does that on his own accord. Sometimes he calls on the people of God to do it. There are other times when he calls on um, the, his enemies to do it. We know, and we, we're not going to have time to read all of the scriptures, but there were times when um, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, as, as we'll get into it a little bit later, were called on uh, to do uh, to be the judgment for God's people when God's people were disobedient. Uh, but let's go to uh, Joshua chapter six. I know we're just we're bouncing around from story to story. Every one of these events could have a whole lesson series even about it. Uh, but Joshua uh, chapter 6 is the story of Jericho. And we all know the, the the song, you know, that Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Okay. Well, that's the the the, the exciting part of the story. The, the little more gruesome part of that story is what was the result of the walls coming tumbling down was that the, the city then lost its protection. And the, the army of the Israelites was able to go in and God commanded them as he did in other times to completely destroy that city, completely destroy every person in that city. Um, and, and we know that that happened with the exception of who? With the exce exception of Rahab, who had helped the spies that had come into that city. So why was she spared when the others had not? Okay, if you look back at that story, it was that she recognized that their God was great. He says, you know, she goes, we've heard the stories about the conquest that your God has done over the other people. He says, and I, I want to know that God. I want to understand. I want to be part of you. I want to be associated with that God. I want to abandon the idolatry of my uh, kinsmen. I want to abandon the idol worship that we're doing here. And I want to become a, a worshiper and uh, of God uh, because of what I've seen and what God has revealed to her. And so she was spared, we know. But that in, in Joshua uh, chapter 6, verse 1, um, um, let's go down to uh, uh, that, that whole story. We're, we're not going to to read it. You know the story. They marched around. They blew the trumpets, um, and and all that happened. But uh, let's go to chapter. Um, oh, it's got too many stickers on my thing here. Verse. Uh, 17, Joshua chapter 6, verse 17. It says, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all 
that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Um, and of course, we know that the result there in verse 20 it says, so the people shouted and the, the walls came down in verse 21, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old and ox and sheep and ass, with the edge of the sword. We usually leave that out of the children's story because it's a little hard for the, you know, it's it's not age appropriate for, for the little kids. They love to sing the story about the, the walls tumbling down and everybody falls down, okay? But, but then to know that God commanded his people to go in and destroy every person, every animal that was there, that's that's hard to, to, to accept. That's hard to, to uh, uh, connect with the God that we know of love, the God that says to, to, to uh, uh, love your enemies, do good to them that despitefully use you and persecute you, to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, all of those things that God teaches us in the New Testament seem to contradict what he was telling them in the Old Testament. But, but does it? Okay. We, we know that God is a righteous God. We started that off at the beginning. We know that God is a holy God. And God will only uh, uh, allow unrighteousness to persist persist for a certain period of time. He has a, 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 a timeline laid out that we don't know, that we are not privy to. And he tells us that. You're not going to know the time, but there is going to be a time of judgment. Okay? The time of judgment for the city of Jericho came at this time. The time of judgment for the people at the flood came at that time. The time of judgment for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah came at that time. But there is a time of judgment coming um, when those same um, scorched earth things that we see in these events that God has described uh, are going to come to this world. Okay, There's going to continue to be wars and there's uh, all of the things are going to happen as, as, it, as it has gone uh, and there's going to continue to be evil in this world up to a point, and God is going to say enough, and he's going to send his son, and he's going to wipe out every man, every woman, every person, every animal, everything that is associated with the evil that's in this world, with this fallen world from the beginning of, of creation, that you know, when Adam and Eve, that original sin, came in, the, the, the curse was death, is coming. Okay, death is is a, is a result of that sin. Okay, death is going to be a result of the sin that's in this world. God is going to say it is enough. He's going to destroy it and he's going to rebuild it. Okay, that's all. It, it, it's it's interesting that we can say, well, we're talking about the Old Testament. You're talking about the end times. What we're talking about is the character of God. We're talking about how God uh, is consistent with his judgment. Yes, he tells us to love others. He tells us that he doesn't want anyone to perish. Do you think God takes pleasure in these things that he commanded? It breaks God's heart when, when he has to, to uh, execute judgment on people. That's, that's no, he, does, he, he takes no joy in that. And I would caution us to do the same thing. We don't want to take joy when somebody suffers the consequences of their sinful actions. How, how can you uh, say that you serve a loving God and take joy in that? We, our, our goal is that no one should uh, see that punishment. Uh, we want, to, just as God sent his only son to forgive our sins so that we don't have to bear that punishment, we want to make sure that as many others uh, uh, follow him and do that as well so that we are not doing that. And that's what uh, we see from a Christian perspective. Now that we've looked at the Old Testament, we look at, at the, the, that God is going to bring judgment at some point. Now let's go to the New Testament and see what God tells us about that in our life and how we should live uh, for him. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. This is Jesus speaking. And it says, uh, he's talking about the end time. And he says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors, rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. These are the beginning of of sorrows. He says, you know, those, all those wars that happened in the Old Testament, all those battles that they fought, those are going to continue. 
We see that even now. You know, there are wars that we say, well, you know, this war is unjust. This person is persecuting that person. Or this war is uh, uh, a just war because uh, somebody is going in to, to rescue somebody that's being oppressed or somebody that's being um, uh, persecuted. And so, you know, all of those things, that, that's, a, that's, again, a whole other lesson. But there are going to be wars. There's nothing we can do about that. Uh, but we do want to continue to stay on the side of God. Um, and, and there's a, uh, uh, an Old Testament story. Oh, uh, which one was it? It was, it was Joshua, if I remember right, when he was going out and he, he was spying out some, an area and he came across somebody and he, he, he was actually an angel of God that was there. Okay, and and his question was the the, the classic um, uh, century uh, century a guard a, the the guard's question: Are you friend or foe? Are you for us or are you against us? And what was the angel's answer? He says, "I'm on God's side." He says, "I you, I don't know where you are, but I'm on God's side, and that's that's where we want to be um, in our politically diverse and and polarized society." Okay, which side is God's side? Well, there's there's enough ungodliness on both sides to go around. Okay, we want to be on God's side. We don't want to choose a side politically. We don't want to choose a side. Uh, based on national pride, we don't want to because because every nation thinks they're good. Every every you know the the, the world is going to uh, the politics are going to change. All of that's going to change. So don't put your faith in the politics. Don't put your faith in the nation. Okay, put your faith in God. Put your allegiance in God, and He will uh, carry us through uh, to the end as He promises here. Um, in in Romans chapter twelve. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. How are we to live? It says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And then it goes on, you know, not to avenge yourself, that God is going to take care of all that for you. It says, as much as is, is possible within you. I, I always am amused by that. I think all of us have a different level of what's within us to live peaceably with other people. Some people's level of peace is, is pretty short. Some people are very long. Um, but but don't use that as an excuse. Say, well, you know, God made me with a short fuse, so it's okay. Because that scripture says as, as much as was in me. I think we all need to continually strive to be more like Christ to be more loving, to be more patient, to be more forgiving, to be more merciful. Okay, yeah, we, we can't use that scripture as a reason to, to beat people up. But there are times, even Christ himself, when he came to the point when he drove the money changers out, that, that there is a time for action when God's laws are being broken and, and God's uh, commandments are, are being violated. There are times when we need to take action. And it's specifically when others are, uh, when the weak are being oppressed, when the widows and orphans are being uh, uh, persecuted, all of those times are, are when God says, you are not only justified in doing that, you're commanded to do that. You're commanded to take action to defend those that are defenseless. And uh, so, th so that's what we want to, to do, to live peaceably, but there are times uh, when we have to step up. But even when we do that, we need to do it in a righteous way. I was listening to a, a, a story or a podcast about John Brown, a famous abolitionist, you know, that uh, was a terror to people. And, you know, he had a righteous uh, motive. He wanted to free the slaves. He wanted to, to uh, which was a scourge on this nation. It was a terrible time. People were treated miserably, and it was it was wrong. Uh, but some of the means that he did, you know, he would take his sons in, in a in a religious context of the way he was preaching. He would drag citizens out of their homes and, and hack them to death with with swords, and and uh, uh, whether they were guilty or not. Okay. Now that's that is not a righteous way to do it, 
uh, but he had righteous motives. So I'm, I'm saying we can have righteous motives and do things in a wrong way sometimes. So we always have to be careful that we're doing the, the what God says, the way God says to do it, and that at the end, God has the final judgment. It's God's uh, uh, responsibility, uh, and that, that is in a lot of ways takes uh, the pressure off of us. It's not our responsibility to, to take God's vengeance. He says, that's, that's my responsibility. You just, you live righteously and you do what you need to do to, to, to live a righteous life. And I will take care of the rest of it. Uh, one more, uh, to finish it up here. First Timothy, uh, chapter two, When we are uncertain as to what we should do and how we should do things, who we should follow, what path we should take um, to, to follow God's command here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-4, through 4, it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I mentioned that briefly earlier. It doesn't matter who's in charge doesn't matter what country, you know, because this is not written to the United States. This is written to mankind, okay? So whatever uh, 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 leadership, that, and we know from the scriptures that God, there's no one in power that God has not put in authority. And it says here that, that, that we need to live peaceably as much as we can uh, with prayer, with, with, with seeking God. And it says to, do, to live a quiet and peaceful life as, in all godliness according to uh, the, the, our Savior. What, do what is acceptable in the sight of God. And it says because the reason is God wants all to be saved. And if your example in a, pol in a politically uh, polarized situation, if your example can lead someone to Christ, isn't that a good reason to lay aside your, your political passion, your patriotism, and say, you know, my allegiance is to a higher power, okay? I, I understand God put the, the authorities here in, in my life, and I'll abide by those as long as they are abiding by God's command. But at some point, you, you have to be always, your actions always have to be uh, through the, 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 the tempered glass of saying, um, I want to do something. The way I act in, in the, the political realm, I need to make sure that that's honoring God and that that's leading people to God because God wants all people to be saved. As that scripture in, in verse 4 says, uh, the, talking about God our Savior says, He or who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So everything that we do, um, we, we need to do it in the context of uh, drawing attention to God and, and that, that God is going to punish our disobedience. God is going to punish our idolatry. So pay attention to what things we have in our life that are uh, unrighteous or are leading us away from God. And, and let's be conscientious to, to eliminate those from our lives. Okay. Boy, that's, I hope we understand it a little better. I, I will be quite honest. I don't even myself completely understand uh, why God does what he does in the, in the way he does it. Uh, but we have to believe and trust that his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And we leave it in his hands at this point.